so much news on the energy storage front that I hardly know where to begin. It's absolutely crazy what's going on. And I've got the smartest guy on the planet. He's going <laughs> to, the futurist, Brian Wong, is here yet again to help us understand what the heck has been going on with energy and what we might be able to anticipate in the future. Brian, great to have you here again. Thanks for introducing me, Randy. Thanks for having me here. I have to say, though, definitely not the smartest. There's a guy, Elon Musk, who's there. For oh, us, okay. so. <laughs> yeah. And some of well, the AI guys are smart, too. I claim, I claim this is the Smart Guy channel because I also have all these other PhDs on, like uh, like John Gibbs and mm -hmm. like uh, Joe. Uh, and Scott. Um, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Joe yeah. Justice, yeah. Yeah, this right. is this is the smart guy channel. Okay, yeah. so this is Randy Kirk. If you hadn't figured that out, and uh, you need to like and subscribe and all that kind of stuff, and follow uh, you want to follow Brian on nextbigfuture.com, his blog, and it, we'll talk more about that at the end. But let's get right into this, Brian. Uh, the energy picture I've been waiting for I don't know three weeks for um, our buddy, um, uh, ah, I'm forgetting his darn name. <laughs> for for uh, Bradford Ferguson. Yes, sir. yes. For, I've been waiting for Bradford Ferguson uh, mm -hmm. to uh, make his announcement with regard to what was actually coming out the doors mm -hmm. in Lathrop. So mm -hmm. what did you think? Yeah, so not just the Lathrop production wrapping up, but they announced the new China factory, which, uh, as we know, things in China go up pretty fast. So... Maybe that thing is working by you know mega packs by the end of the year, because yeah. you know a few months to throw up a building. It's only a target size building, you know. They, there's target size buildings all over China, and just stocking them equipment and get, get going. So I, I'm anticipating a really fast surprising ramp for that. I'm, I'm be good to have an upside China surprise on those yeah. on those packs. Well, I thought the most interesting thing about Bradford's report, Bradford's reporting was. And he may even be wrong on this, but he got some ins kind of uh, whisper in his ear from maybe an employee or something, as well as taking a look at the inside of the factory and said, it looks like it's set up for two lines and that maybe only one line is effectively operating at this time, mm -hmm. which at 12 a day, which is what he's reporting is roughly the number would make sense. I mean, all that mm -hmm. kind of, you can follow those dots around the room and it kind mm -hmm. of sounds like, okay, your maximum capacity is 25 a day and mm -hmm. you've got potentially two lines, 12 a day or so mm -hmm. would be about right. If you're only wanting one line, uh, is that kind of how you took it too? Or did you see anything else that I missed on that? Um, I actually have not actually uh, seen that. I heard Bradford talk about it, but I did not look at uh, his, his video uh, discussing it, but I, I did listen to him talk with uh, Matt Smith about it and a few other people talking about it. So, um, you know, it, it seems consistent that uh, that level of production's there. Um, I'm actually not as um, um, concerned about those issues. About you know, they, they can get to that that production level. I'm fully confident about that. For me, um, and I'm, you know, we can transition over to this. You can decide how you want to handle it. But I looked at master plan part three. Yes, and I've broken that down to the endpoint as well as the general uh, what happens for the next few years scaling up multiple um, more um, mega pack factories and and how that works out. So there's several insights from the master plan that uh, Tesla revealed some things for that. Oh, okay, reveal away. I mean, first okay. of all, please understand that I did put out a video the other day where I listed why I thought they would be in certain locations, mm -hmm. uh, which is primarily uh, where the sun shines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. that's the best place to put them is where the sun shines. Yeah. Uh, and number two, I, I mentioned uh, that I, I I gave a list of where I thought the next various factories would go, which was of course completely pulled out of out of air. But you know, hopefully, hopefully some analysis. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, came up, of course, I my theory is they're going to try to shoot for one terawatt by the end of the mm -hmm. decade. Mm -hmm. So with, with so knowing that I've already done that, now fill in your blanks with the with whatever else you found in there. That, so in their um, um, page about you know total uh, energy storage, right? They they give various totals and figures of like, you know, we need to have thirty terawatts or whatever. We need to have this and that. They said two point three terawatt hours per year of megapacks. That that was a line in there. So that basically aligns to sixty Lathrops. 
right? 60 that times 40. Assuming, that, that's, a, that's worldwide for everybody. All worldwide. manufacturers combined. Okay. All, all manufacturers combined, right? And, and the other thing was they said, um, there was another slide in there, which said, how much energy storage do you need for vehicles? How much do you need for um, electrification of energy, which is basically solar and wind? And then how much you need for airplanes? How much you need for ships? And how much you need for, um, you know, uh, uh, thermal heat, some kind of thermal heat application, right? So the first two categories, number one, electrification of energy for the 30 terawatt hours of, of um, solar and wind, right? Mm -hmm. So the world it, at the end of last year is just shy of two terawatt hours solar and wind, 1.1 terawatt hours of solar, uh, a little over 800 terawatt, sorry, gigawatt hours of, of one, one terawatt hour and 800 gigawatt hours. Mm. So 0 0.8 terawatt hours of, of wind. And they're adding um, 260 gigawatt hours globally um, last year. They mm. project 320 to 350 gigawatt hours this year. Mm -hmm. um, another figure that uh, Tessa gave was they thought we would get to 610 gigawatt hours of um, solar added per year and then 400 gigawatt hours of, of wind, mm -hmm. right? So we're already, this year could be halfway to the plateau level that they think for solar. And then we're at about 25% um, for, for wind, right? So, but the thing is the, so the, the, the yearly run rate is, is the key. So mm -hmm. the fact that they say that we'll need um, six megapack factories for that electrification, right? If we're building in, you know, half the solar or, or you know, get to half of the solar and wind, then we need three big factories at least to support that, right? And you may end up scaling, because we'll scale to 600 gigawatt hours. Like say in three years, we get to, that go from 350 up to 600 gigawatt hours of solar, adding it up. And then right. we just add at that level for 20 years or something, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the mega pack thing, going up to the, the six plateau that we need for the electrification energy, we could head to that level in the next three years. I see. Right? So we definitely, we're behind, we need three. And China has, you know, 500 gigawatt hours of solar, right? Yeah. So there's this pent up demand for, hey, we need more mega packs to, to, to go with that, um, that solar and that, that wind. Right. We, we can shove stuff into uh, pumped hydro, but we can't address the short, you know, initial reactive part. So anyway, so definitely before 2030, we need six uh, mega pack factories. Maybe in three years, we need six. We definitely need three. So we need to build another mega pack factory. Our good friend, Lars, show that there's a CATL partnership with some other companies making a 10 gigawatt hour per year um, energy pack storage thing. Maybe some other guys have some small things. So uh, Tesla could toss in another factory or just scale up the China one to 60 gigawatt hours um, and, and you know get to that 100 gigawatt hour per year level. Then the vehicle stuff, vehicle needs about four or five times more than that. Needs about like 24, 20, you know, again, it's, not exact, right? But they need that level for the full electrification. So bulk of that is for, um, for semi and for cyber truck when that scale out, right? Right. But there's more need to put mega packs into every supercharging station. More need to add mega packs. You would start overlapping the scaling of both things, and you need to start filling in the pipe to get yeah. more of that electrification in. Yeah, and so, and so to, make it, to make it really clear here, every single uh, supercharger station, certainly any that have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 uh, pumps, if you will, to, um, uh, uh, at a station will do very much better if they have a mega pack there. Mm -hmm. um, when there's only one or two or three, maybe not. So some of these people that are, some of the competitors, the Tesla that are putting these large uh, charging stations, I mean, smaller uh, charging stations may not need a mega pack, but the larger ones that Tesla's doing, which I think they're averaging 10 mm -hmm. at this point, uh, they're, they're, they would just make a lot more money for that station if they have a, a mega charger and of course solar um, mm -hmm. as well. Then on the supercharger, I mean, I'm sorry, the mega, uh, on the semi trucks uh, with the, uh, what are we calling those mega charger? No. I'm I'm called the mega charger. Mega, mega charging charge. station. Okay, so the mega charger stations 
whether those are at a factory or a distribution center or even at a retailer or something like that, uh, or whether they're at a truck stop, again, pretty much you've proven that they would need a mega charger. I mean, they would need a mega pack, period. <laughs> it's like right. for every, if they have one truck, they probably yeah. should, they should probably also purchase. Yeah, every six trucks, you should have semi truck, you should have like one mega pack. Uh, every 30 cyber truck, you should have a mega pack. Uh, and each of these stations, you can have multiple and end up with like 10 mega packs. There's these huge, like 500 truck diesel stations. So those points, you'll need like, you know, 50 mega packs like that right. with a lot of solar. Right. Yeah. Okay. So then that's a huge use for for the uh, for these uh, store energy storage units. How many factories then do we need for that? So total for all these trucks and and for also for all these other vehicles, you know, we get to say close to 100 percent vehicles, you know, in 2030, say roughly 2030, 2032, right. a couple of years off, three years off, whatever. Um, then you'll have like 67 million of those and you're at a million semi trucks per year going to 2 million, 3 million. They said 3 million. And then um, you have like 5 million, you know. Uh, of the um, cyber truck vehicles and cyber vans, all in that twenty thirty to twenty thirty five time frame, right? You you max out that right. you know at that level, right? And then you'll need thirty of the mega pack factories, twenty twenty four for the vehicles, six for the um, electrification of solar and wind, right? All that needed by uh, twenty thirty five ish, right? And then so that's beyond over, that, that's over a terawatt right there, right? And then at what point do you get? building in your stuff for planes and ships and for right. the other applications, right? And there's, so there's, roughly, and, yeah. and by the way, there's really significant other applications. Right. Every and that, factory over 20,000 square feet mm -hmm. probably will have solar in a mega pack. I mean, eventually. Right, right. And utility things, stuff like that. So the um, so endpoint is 60, around 2040-ish, right? 30 plus around 2035, you know, even go 20, 2045, 60, right? So, so you basically start making two to three um, later factories per year starting in 2025, right? So I, I get one, two, the Shanghai one could be a bit bigger. They could make some bigger. Then you start dumping in two or three every year, 25, 26, 27, until I get to say 25, 20, 2025 for Tesla, if they're the ones leading it out, maybe they're only at, only at 20 um, in um, 2035, right? 2030. And each of those factories, they also gave that number, $400 million, $10 million per gigawatt hour, yeah. right? So $400 million to make- Produce. To produce 20 to $25 billion per year yeah. in revenue. So four hundred million dollars, twenty twenty five. So basically, once I'm getting up to like five percent of capacity, I've Sorry. made back the revenue off off the the mega pack. Plus, not even factoring in all of the subsidy and other stuff to do it. So, so then, yeah. So then, okay. So so what we've been saying all along is true. The master plan proved it that mm -hmm. Tesla is going to ramp as fast as they can to build these mega pack factories, and it's extremely profitable. The two things then left on the table. Uh, which, uh, you know, where I thought was important was, you know, how fast are they ramping Lathrop? Because it's interesting and useful to know what's going on there. But then the two other things were what the margins are. And of course, we won't know. And it, I've been saying on my channel that we may not know, not only, we may not really find out first quarter because the bookkeeping is so weird. Mm -hmm. uh, but by second or third quarter, we should really begin to know unless it's point blank asked and answered by Tesla, mm -hmm. that it's around 40% or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, can't I can't figure out how it could be less than 40% based right. on all the reporting that's been done. Right. I don't think it's less than 40% either. And then based on my calculation, you know, $400 billion per year of revenue from these factories, you know, from, you know, from like uh, 20 some factories in 2030, 2032, and then by 2040, a trillion dollars yeah. in, in, in stuff. So if we get to some mix of vehicles with a fair, with my more and your more optimistic assumptions around semi and cyber truck, the 20 million vehicles, which I always think should be um, some level of um, uh, next-gen vehicle equivalents, because yeah. 
you know, you need to do 10 to one. So it'd beyond 20 million, it'd be like 30, 40 million vehicle equivalents of those small vehicles, uh, maybe 50 million of those, you know, in 20, 2030. Um, by the way, what Brian, those that watch my channel or watch Brian all the time, you know what he's talking about, but a, a cyber truck is probably the equivalent in terms of the battery usage and the retail of about 10, no, about well, 10, 10, 10 semi small of the, yeah. of the new Se -se cyber truck yeah. three, uh, semi 10. Yeah. Right. Semi would be 10 times 12 times, yeah, 10 to 12 times the retail, the, the sticker price, and also maybe more than that in terms of the profit compared to the generation three vehicles. Yeah, I'm sorry, right? right. So then you're looking at um. Four hundred billion dollars of energy, eight hundred billion dollars of um, of vehicles and trucks, and the vehicle truck mix could be like a little over half regular passenger vehicles, and then the other half, almost half, um, semi and cyber truck, okay, and possibly even more. So then that's the kind of ratio of your one point two trillion in in um, in, in right. twenty thirty, and then three four trillion, five trillion in twenty forty. Yeah, yeah, I think that, and and we're and we're pretty much in the same in the same uh, uh, ballpark there with regard to what I call the five pillars, only three of the pillars, which are currently under production. Mm -hmm. So I call my pillars are just the semi energy and auto auto right. and light truck. Right. So uh, yeah, and, and I think I came up with about the same something somewhere in the range of 1.2 to 1.5 trillion, which would be a, enough. Mm -hmm. But then we don't talk about the about the AI, which we'll probably have in the next yes, video, yes, yes. which FSD, I'm now hugely, hugely optimistic about that, and we can discuss why. Oh, oh okay. So, all right, but there's one more question. There's one more mm -hmm. question on uh, on the uh, uh, on on the energy side, and that was we had this reporting the other day that nobody's talking about. Again, I don't know how people miss this, because everybody. One of the big questions that comes up, comes up on energy now that it's an issue, is how how does Tesla stay ahead of the crowd with regard to tech. Mm -hmm. um, and already, my understanding from the from the research I did was that they're already way ahead of everybody on tech in terms of the reliability, in terms of the instant startup. I mean, when it is delivered and hooked up, it's ready to go. But now, all of a sudden, we have uh, the reporting. I think from Electric or Electric or I think that's who it was that they have a whole new level of uh, of software coming out. Either already came out or coming out quickly that will just bump them up again. Uh, did you read right. that? And you're my you're my scientist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you read that? And because you'd understand it better than I did, probably. Right. Yeah. So so Tesla's software advantage there. You know, where they got the auto bidding, where they have the the management of it, the cooling management, all those kind of things. There's a lot of like um, detailed industrial um, software stuff that they're doing better than everyone else. Uh, you see that in the reliability of the supercharging stations. You know, electrified America. You know, those things are always breaking down, and this is that little thing of uh, quality, which is you know that's what Toyota built there. You know, getting to right. you know three right. times bigger than Ford or whatever like that, based on superior quality, right? That's what the Japanese did over the you know eighties and nineties like that was to have superior quality. So Tesla on the quality side for these things matter. It's just you know acceleration quality. There's various things which people cared about before, and suddenly. Tesla's doing it and somehow they're just ignoring it. Yeah, so the quality and the software and the software advantage is huge. So yeah, quality and software advantage is where they're doing it. And they're doing both. You know, software advantage makes for quality. Um, quality makes for software advantage. You know, they're, those things are, are together. And yeah. so, yeah, so that's where they're winning. All right. Well, Brian, as always, super informative and super super helpful. And uh, we're going to have Brian on a couple more times over the weekend. I think there's three other episodes that Brian is going to be talking about. The semi-truck, he's going to be talking about um, maybe some robo-taxi stuff. And anyway, you want to hit the notify button. You want to subscribe and hit notify because then you're going to see Brian over and over again. Uh, and then you also want to follow Brian on nextbigfuture.com. Lots of cool uh, information about all kinds of scientific issues, um, and uh, and then you want to uh, you know subscribe to both his Patreon and my Patreon. I mean, I think if Brian's five bucks a month and I'm five bucks a month, I mean, you know, it's what a, a, a couple of lattes a month. Okay, so <laughs> again, Brian, great to have you on. Thank you very much, and for the rest of you, it's been great talking to you.